Welcome to Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 6. My name's Chris Abraham, and today the TLDR is the Rittenhouse case and the Rittenhouse verdict has almost nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse. It has to do with uh, continued precedence, setting precedent that defending yourself outside of your home with a firearm is still a defensible act and any type of law that results in a verdict that supports the right of an American to use lethal force against even an attacker who's only using uh, his body uh, or a non-proportionate uh, weapon such as a, uh, a knife, a skateboard, a rock, a plastic bag, etc. People are always looking for <clears throat> high, highly political uh, trials that are being handled by activist U.S. attorneys and activist AUSAs, assistant U.S. attorneys, and public prosecutors who are in it to make a name on prosecuting against uh, gun users, gun uh, defenders, people who use firearms in <clears throat> self-defense. There is a uh, there is a trend in especially cities that you can make your career, your entire career, based on uh, prosecuting someone into jail who has used a firearm in self-defense, even if that's in your home, even if it's cut and dry. And many people, when you hear them talk about the Rittenhouse case, most people who are on the side of uh, the defense in terms of this being a cut and dry uh, self-defense charge believe that he shouldn't even have been charged. They believe that in most cases, were this not political, were the prosecutors not activists, were not this a nationally recognized case where a public prosecutor could in fact get uh, national recognition and where uh, there is an extreme amount of appeasement with regards to allowing riots to happen for whatever reason in, in cities all around the country. So this was supposed to be a flag, uh, if you will, in the ground. This was supposed to be a line in the sand. This was supposed to be a red line. This was supposed to be uh, a stake in the ground that was supposed to show <clears throat> that um, that guns are not welcome. And instead, because of hubris, fully because of hubris, pride and hubris and so forth, uh, this became uh, what everybody thought at the end of the day was going to be a, uh, ca a, um, uh, a kangaroo court, uh, but in fact it turned out exactly as the law prescribed, which is uh, Kyle Rittenhouse very publicly uh, around the world, even with any number of falsehoods and downright lies and dis actual disinformation about everything, and I don't even know why they needed to do that, because it was still a disgusting, terrible event, and nobody should have been in that street that late at night. You know, it was a riot. Nobody should be there. Kyle Rittenhouse shouldn't have been there. Um, Grossman, Grosskreutz, uh, Huber, is that his name? Uh, Jumping Man, uh, Disco Duck. Uh, yellow pants, all those different people should not have been there. <clears throat> it was an after party. It was not a protest. It was a riot. So, yes, you're right. Kyle Rittenhouse shouldn't have been there armed. But also Grosskreutz, Grosskreutz shouldn't have been there armed either. Uh, so it was basically a draw, if you will. Um so let's take a break and I will go into more detail, uh, completely shooting from the hip, completely not a lawyer, completely not referring to, uh, to anything. I'm just talking out my butt. But if you know, Chris Gast, 
That's what you're here for. So I'll be right back after the break. Oh, thank you. Welcome back. This is Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 6. I believe that this is Episode 6. And this episode is, as we say it is, um, about the fact that this has nothing to do with Kyle Rittenhouse. This is just a sweet, sweet, sweet precedent. This is a precedent that uh, enables... In all future court cases, the defense attorney can use the Kyle Rittenhouse versus the state or the city of Kenosha, the state of Wisconsin, Rittenhouse versus Wisconsin or uh, Rittenhouse versus Kenosha. It will be a precedent that you can use to show that in the United States, there's no such thing as, as proportional response. Uh, I don't know who the kook was in the prosecution to say that it was Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse's job to keep his gun down or put his gun down and defend by fist and elbows and and kicks and so forth. But there is there's never been any expectation in self-defense law that there needs to be any proportionality. In fact, there doesn't even need to be any physical touch. Uh, the, um, let me look this up. All right. I'm going to just talk about legal defense in Virginia because that's where I live. Um, there are many more states that are more, uh, free in terms of, um, support, uh, stand your ground, uh, are not, if you will, in many cases, uh, turning, if you will, blue or purple from red, and Virginia is becoming more and more anti-gun, anti-firearm, anti all that kind of stuff. So, but let's look at the law as it is. Even though if I were to ever defend myself uh, with a firearm and killed someone uh, who was either breaking into my apartment or attacking me in the street or mugging me or whatever... Uh, this is the law that I have. Even though in Northern Virginia, I'm told that there are tons and tons of activist prosecutors, activist um, public prosecutors, activists, AUSAs, and activists. Uh, I think that the Arlington uh, attorney, uh, U.S. attorney, is is um, anti uh, anti gun as well. So. It would be an uphill battle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I hope it never happens. I'm all about evading, avoiding, and running. But if someone goes ahead and threatens my life by uh, preparing to or actually attacking me or mugging me or trying to attack me or whatever, and I'm armed, I will use that, that uh, deadly force. So here's the copy. Virginia's self-defense laws provide that a non-aggressor is justified in using force against another person if, one, he reasonably, reasonably believes, two, that the force is necessary, three, to protect himself from imminent use of unlawful force by the other person. Although not codified in statute, Virginia case law supports a version of the Castle Doctrine providing that under certain circumstances a person may use deadly force against someone entering his home. Virginia also has a no retreat, or more commonly known as stand your ground law, which means you are not required to retreat. In other words, try to escape prior to using self-defense under certain circumstances. Self-defense can't provide a legal basis as a defense in cases in part involving murder, assault and battery, malicious wounding, and unlawful wounding. Uh, let's see. Legal defense of self-defense in Virginia reasonably believes he is in imminent danger of an overt act threatening unlawful force, seriously bodily harm, bodily harm or death, and uh, use the amount of force reasonable in retaliation to the harm threatened. So, in actuality, when you're trained 
to uh, defend yourself with a firearm as part of the concealed carry uh, permitting, uh, you're told that when someone, and now this is threatening unlawful force. If you're in imminent danger of an overt act threatening unlawful force, seriously bodily harm or death, the threatening part doesn't mean you actually receive unlawful force, seriously bodily harm or death. It means that you just feel threatened with it, right? <clears throat> so that's no, there's no expectation that you start getting beat on and then end up on your back fighting furiously and then in a last gasp like in a movie, uh, shoot someone and they fall and slump down onto you. That's not the expectation. And use of amount of force reasonable in retaliation. Let's say you're using a firearm. They tell you that if you feel like you need to uh, shoot someone to defend yourself against bodily harm, uh, you need to fire enough times to to neutralize the attacker. That means uh, one of three things, right? That means uh, the person decides to skedaddle. That's neutralization. So the moment the person turns tails and run, you, you turns tail and runs, you're not, uh, it's not legal to fire after them uh, in retreat. Uh, secondly, uh, generally the case is, is you, you shoot at them until they fall to the ground or until they stop attacking you. That can be between one and ten bullets, depending on how ornery the person is to not, to not stop. Right, so they tell you that when you're trained in this, that you should fire into center mass, and center mass to make it easy for you to imagine is uh, basically Superman's S, <clears throat> and then to stop firing the moment the person stops uh, their their momentum, stops uh, assaulting, attacking, or assault, um, um, or 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 hurting you. And then finally, I guess the third one is, uh, is you know, if they, if they expire. Uh, there is also concepts of maliciousness. So generally speaking, the reason why you're told to uh, use, first of all, use a moderate caliber firearm uh, using a moderate, uh, a moderate defensive ammo and... Uh, Etc. So, in other words, and and not and firing at center mass, because if you defend yourself by shooting someone between the eyes, that is considered malicious intent. So it's better to go ahead and shoot in their center mass, which is like I said, uh, Superman's S, uh, and, until they stop uh, pursuing you, rather than. Um, Definitely trying to shoot them in the head and, you know, make it, it's about stopping the attack. It's not about killing your opponent. Uh, mind you, it's with bullets, so they're very lethal, a lethal choice in self-defense. And by the way, uh, self-defense is not sporting. My buddy who travels the world as part of the government tells me that, uh, for example, Italians consider uh, the castle doctrine and the hold your, uh, the stand your ground doctrine to be extremely non-sporting because in, in, in Italy, uh, you have to, if you don't use proportional response, you need to defend yourself against someone with a baseball bat with a baseball bat. You need to, I guess, defend against someone with a knife with a knife. You need to Defend against someone who's trying to beat you with your fists or your knees or elbows or feet. And if you do anything not like that, if you're improportionate, then you can end up in jail forever. That's why people are more than happy with getting beat up in Europe. And then the, use of, then the reasonable belief that the use of force was justified. The reasonable appearance that the use of force was justified is, is assessed from the subjective viewpoint of the, dependent, uh, the defendant at the time he acted. Therefore, a person is justified in using force to repel an unlawful imminent attack, imminent, not happening, uh, imminent attack, if he holds the subjective belief, the personal belief, not the objective belief, 
the personal. It's built into law. The person is justified in using force to repel an unlawful, imminent attack if he holds the subjective belief that the force is necessary, even if it turns, even if it later turns out that his belief was wrong, provided that his belief was reasonable at the time. So, if you are scaredy cat and you think that everybody's trying to kill you, uh, there's going to be a much different. Uh, you're going to have a much, uh, if you will, lighter trigger finger probably than someone who who walks around believing that nothing bad will ever happen to them. Uh, if you are frail or old or or have a, a, a comorbidity or uh, you're weak or uh, you're a woman or you're uh, you're more likely to be victimized or let's say you're part of the spectrum or you're LGBTQ or you're trans or you're a trans black woman, et cetera. Like these are different things that mean that you're probably just because you're provocative, just because uh, you look like you deserve to get beat up because you're either exceedingly appearing vulnerable or young or, or, or fragile or weak or old, or completely vulnerable to mugging or whatnot, uh, the gun is considered to be an amazing equalizer, and you don't have to be strong. Uh, you just have to be strong enough to hold a gun and, uh, and pull the trigger. Uh, 1.2, Eminent Overt Act. The purpose of this requirement is so that a person may not claim that he punched, hit, stabbed another person because of threatened bodily injury regarding future potential harm. This reflects the position that you use the force to repel an attack may only be used when, mes- when necessary. So in other words, this law explicitly does not allow preemptive attack. It does not allow preemption. It does not allow you to go ahead and attack first for fear that at some point in the future, uh, that person is a threat to you in the future. So it it has to be done in self-defense, not in prophylaxis. Merely being afraid that another person may inflict inflict bodily harm or bodily injury against him does not justify inflicting bodily injury against that person. There must be an overt act that puts the person in immediate danger of unlawful touching. Unlawful touching. So remember that. There is a thing called unlawful touching. Imminent means an immediate real threat to one's safety. As the court in Bird stated uh, in the context of the threat of serious bodily injury, there must be some act menacing some act menacing present peril and the act must be of such a character as to afford a reasonable ground for believing there is a design to do some serious bodily harm and imminent danger of carrying such design into immediate execution. Unlawful force, seriously bodily harm or death. There is an important distinction between threats involving mere unlawful force and threats involving seriously bodily harm or death. Threats involving mere bodily harm do not permit a person to use deadly force. Only threats involving great bodily injury or death justify the use of deadly force. A person may only use deadly force if there was a present danger of great bodily injury. Words alone are not sufficient to justify the use of deadly force. Let me repeat that. Sticks and stones may break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Being triggered, whatever the fuck that is, is not significant enough to shoot someone over. You, words never result. You can never shoot someone because they insulted your mother. For instance, if you were defending yourself from someone trying to commit a murder, a malicious wounding, or a rape, you may be justified in using deadly force in self-defense, provided the other element of defenses are met. The other elements of defense are met. Deadly force is defined as force intended or likely to cause death or grievous bodily injury. This definition focuses on the likely outcome as opposed to the actual result. In contrast, many batteries do not constitute deadly force. This is true even if the victim subsequently dies unexpectedly from the injuries. However, if the person injured Injured is elderly or very sick or otherwise a person who would be likely to die from a battery, the battery may constitute deadly force. 
Force use must be reasonable under the circumstances. In Virginia, a person is only allowed to use the amount of force necessary to repel the force used against him. This rule requires that the force used must be proportional to the harm threatened. Excessive force is not protected. Therefore, when threatened uh, with a non-deadly attack, a person is not justified in using deadly force to repel the attack. Now, that's pretty confusing because the FBI... Uh, has proven time and time again that more people die at the hands of uh, of of a brutal physical attack than they do by firearms. So, I guess that really comes down to uh, guess that comes down to situation and and the quality of your lawyer uh, and whether or not you really feel like your life was harmed. I mean, I I guess in written houses world uh there were threats made uh there were gun there were gunshots fired and he was extremely vulnerable in enemy territory uh and he wasn't with his other friends he wasn't near the cops he was running and running and running and being chased down i would say that that is pretty threatening Virginia's no retreat or stand your ground law. In Virginia, the law does not necessarily require a person retreat prior to using force or even deadly force when he is confronted with an aggressor, provided the other elements of the defense are met. As a general rule, Virginia does not require a person retreat before using deadly force when confronted with an aggressor. However, where a person has been the aggressor or otherwise at fault, he must follow the rules regarding to excusable self-defense, see below, for the use of self-defense to be lawful. In order to determine whether a person is required to retreat prior to using self-defense, it is necessary to determine whether the use of self-defense is justified or merely excusable. This focuses on the prior action of the person claiming self-defense. Justified self-defense, justifiable self-defense applies where a person is free from any fault in provoking the attack. If the defendant is even slightly at fault in contributing to the assault, the use of self-defense is not justifiable but may be excusable. See below. Excusable self-defense, and this might be where Rittenhouse exists because in many cases people perceived him as being provocative by open carrying, by being a, a counter-protester in a uh, Black Lives Matter um, protest, riot, etc. In other words, a non-welcome guest, an unwelcome guest. Excusable self-defense. In some circumstances, a defendant may be justified using deadly force, even though he is not entirely, he is not an entirely innocent party, but certainly certain requirements must, must be met. The court in Bailey stated, excusable homicide and self-defense occurs where the accused Although in some fault in the first instance in provoking or bringing on the difficulty, when attack retreats as far as possible, announces his desire for peace, and kills his adversary from a reasonably apparent necessity to preserve his own life, or save himself from great bodily harm. An aggressor may be defined as one whose affirmative unlawful act is reasonably calculated to produce an affray uh, foreboding uh, injurious or fatal consequence. This follows Virginia's general rule that if you were at fault or had provoked the aggressor, you are required to retreat as far as safely possible before using deadly force. The aggressor may use force in self-defense only after having totally abandoned the original attack, which is, I think, letter of the law, exactly what, uh, what Kyle Rittenhouse did. He ran and he ran and he ran. Crazy. Mutual combat. The legal definition of self-defense does not apply in situations where two persons willingly or voluntarily mutually engage in combat to gratify their passion. When someone is assaulted, presuming the element of self-defense are met, he may defend himself. The ensuing struggle between the two is not mutual combat. And then there's a bunch of stuff about defense of others, defense of dwelling, but I'm not going to go into that because this is a long document. Um, so... That is what people are so excited about with regards to Kyle Rittenhouse. I mean, he has definitely made a hero. He has definitely made a, a uh, uh, if you will, a non-martyred martyr. He is, uh, 
he is definitely a conservative and gun rights hero for sure. Especially for the fact that he doesn't have a rap sheet. I can't tell you how often, often, often I'm being told how uh, much of a scumbag uh, Grosskreutz and Grossman and uh, uh, Huber and um, all the other people are. So he's also uh, squeaky clean, right? So you got a, a, a squeaky queen, clean guy who is a lifeguard and all these other things. So he will be canonized for sure, and he will enter sainthood. But on the other hand, nobody cares about him really. Like he is a manifestation of everything with regards to pro-Second Amendment, pro-concealed carry, pro-lethal uh, gun self-defense, uh, pro-lethal gun uh, defense of others, uh, pro-carry, pro-open carry, pro, pro, uh, pro street-defending, pro uh, I belong here because this is my neighborhood, or even I belong here because this is America, and uh, just because I dress like a, an armed slut doesn't mean I deserve to be uh, attacked, and all these other things. So that is really, it's case law, it's uh, um, uh, court law, it's precedence, it's all those things that make people more confident that their rights for self-defense, their Second Amendment rights, their right for gun ownership, their right, right for gun carrying, whether it's concealed or open, have been uh, further, if you will, written in stone with regards to, uh, to, to the legal uh, to the to the legal canon, if you will, and towards the precedent, precedent, precedent going forward. Um, so that's all I got. I will include that document in the uh, show notes, and I hope you're doing well. And when I come back, I will tell you how you can contact me. <laughs> Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. This is Chris Cast. My name's Chris Abraham. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. And I'm very happy that you lasted all the way to here. And I'm really happy in general because I went to the, to the doctor today and uh, for a yearly physical. And it seemed like everything is okay. Uh, I do not know. But I'm hoping... And, uh, if you want to reach me, I'm at plus one, two Oh two, three, five, two, five, zero, five, one. Uh, you can text me. You can call me. I won't answer. You can, uh, WhatsApp me. You can telegram me. You can signal me. You can text me. Like I said, uh, you could get me on Skype at Chris Abraham, one word. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Abraham, on YouTube at Chris Abraham, on anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham. You can schedule a call with me at calendly.com slash Chris Abraham. I'm at Instagram on Chris Abraham. I'm on uh, Facebook, facebook.com slash Chris Abraham, uh, youtube.com slash Chris Abraham. Uh, my home site is chrisabraham.com. My email is chris at abraham.su, and if you would be so kind, go everywhere you listen or find your podcasts and give me five stars and like me, subscribe me, uh, review me, and all those fun things. I think it matters a lot, and I appreciate you, I love you, and I'll see you next time. Ciao. Yay! Oh!